of you on simple elbow dislocations, radial head fractures, and tennis elbows. I have a disclosure, I'm a designer of this brace, and my wife owns the company, I'm also a designer with Acumen. So initially, it was Lars Peter Muller was supposed to be the maestro, and uh, unfortunately, he can't be here. And I was gonna tell him first, are you serious? 10 minutes, three subjects, and then afterwards, people are gonna tear me apart. And it feels like three against one a little bit, I have to say. So I'm gonna talk about my own experience, what I tell my patients. And um, I'll start with simple elbow dislocation. It's actually quite simple. Some of you may have seen this video already. It's uh, diagnosis is very simple. The guy falls, he knows it's dislocated. Everyone around him knows it's dislocated, it's, it's easy. You know, the, uh, the opponent, that'll be in, in, uh, in the, there he is. He knows it's dislocated, everyone knows. <laughs> You go to the ER and get radiographs. If there's no or minimal fracture, you get a close reduction. We prefer to use sedation for this and our um, ER doctors know how to do this. If spontaneous dislocation surgery, what do I mean by that? Our ER doctors or our residents, depending on who does it, take them through a range of motion. No stress, no, no varus or valgus stress, no rotation stress, just range of motion. If it dislocates spontaneously before 30 degrees, but obviously that's debatable, then uh, surgery is, uh, is indicated. If the post-production radiograph is negative, then we're talking about a simple dislocation. Um, some people in the audience will tell, oh, sorry, in the, uh, in the <laughs> panel will tell you that you need an MRI for this, but you definitely do not need an MRI for this. You need, well, you need an MRI if you want to scare the patients into uh, surgery. That's, that's the, only, the only reason. <laughs> when you are in doubt, get a CT. Get a CT because fractures and loose bodies, they will change your... Change it. They might change your mind. However, MRI for me, that doesn't change my treatment plan because the decision to do each surgery, yes or no, for me is, uh, is clinical. So the majority of patients will get conservative treatment. There's minimum or no chance of recurrence. Mobilize the elbow straight away. We still use a brace, um, and we do this from 60, 30, 0. What do I mean by that? In the first two weeks, they're allowed to, use, to go to 60, then to 30, then to 0. There is no difference in re-dislocation rate, so the brace does not support these patients, uh, at least not for re-dislocation, but there is a clear difference in confidence. Patients are, are confident, they move, and they, they want to move because they, they think that the brace is protecting them. We have a little bit of experience here, um, not published because uh, no one was interested to publish this. So 76 patients included, 29 patients in the non-op group, and they would get, when we gave them a choice, this was one year after the treatment, we gave them a choice, brace plaster or sling for comfort, and 90% said, said they were very happy with the brace, and 7% um, said a sling would have been uh, okay for me. And they mainly talked about the protective feeling, so this was uh, a score out of 10, 8.9 out of 10, satisfaction 8.6, compliance 99%, um, only one patient did, did not uh, comply, and there was a language barrier. And then I told them six weeks, throw it away, and then the 42% said they, uh, they uh, used it for an average of three weeks after I told them to throw it away. And for example, public transport or parties. So we still keep, uh, keep doing that. When you do surgery, it's mainly for associated lesions. My preference is arthroscopy, uh, cartilage, loose bodies, LCL repair, and then evaluation of uh, MCL, although uh, we know Paul Aragoni is working on a way to, uh, to fix the MCL or even uh, reconstruct the MCL arthroscopically. So this is what I was talking about. If it, in this case, subplexes or dislocates without any stress, this is an indication for surgery. <clears throat> Sometimes I do surgery on, on uh, patients because they need perfect stability. This is a professional basketball player. Um, so in patients like this, I tell them, listen, we can do rehab and, we can, and the chance of you being very good at six months is very high. However, if I feel and this is not evidence-based again, but I feel that if I fix the ligaments to the spot where I want them to heal, then I'm a little bit more confident than in six months. We don't find out that the, the rehab didn't work and that we have, to do, uh, um, we have to do reconstruction at six months. And for professional players, that's two rehab. So um, I'm a little bit more exp uh, aggressive. This is that guy, so this is what you saw. The extensive tendons have torn, uh, not, not only the, uh, the ligament, uh, and on the medial side was the same, same view. Post our protocol, we use this brace for 24 hours, and then active and passive mobilization from day one, and again, the progressive brace uh, that we use um, if needed. This is a little bit about the rehab. This is a young goalkeeper, and he, he, was, he, was, he, he blocked the ball, and uh, unfortunately, he ruptured his MCL by doing so. 
and I learned a lot from this, uh, from this guy. So um, um, he went uh, back to his team, and the sports, uh, physi uh, the sports physio started working with him, and he kept on sending me these videos, and I, every time I died a little bit inside, because I thought this was not very good, but he had no problems with his rehab. So with the rehab, I've become more, more aggressive because of, uh, obviously, one player. Okay, second thing, radial head fractures. Again, ER, get radiographs. If, there, if it's up to two or maybe five millimeter displacement, there's some debate there. Um, they get a sling for comfort and maybe aspiration. Unfortunately, I had this twice myself, once on the left side, once on the right side. And um, aspiration, really, when you, when you can get there early, first two, three days, it's, it decreases the pain by 90%. It's amazing. So I do recommend um, aspiration, although I don't recommend aspiration if an ER doctor doesn't know what he's doing. So uh, um, if they come to, to a person who knows how to aspirate the joint, then it's, it's such a big pain relief and um, it, it speeds up the rehab a lot. In the clinic, I check rotation, so I ask them to, to, um, ask them to, uh, to relax, put the elbow 90 degrees, I take the hand and I slowly pronate and supinate. All patients are scared, so, what you, so you do it slowly. If there's no mechanical block to rotation, then there's no surgery, and then I tell them, you just do what you can with your arm, but please don't do what you want. I think this is a... Uh, every time I show this video, I, I have the feeling that I need to make a new one, because um, you'll see in a second. So, clear hemarthrosis, type 1 radial fracture, non-displaced. This is the range of motion that she has. Um, so the reason I want to make a new one is because I'm not wearing gloves and I still have my watch on and everything. <laughs> but that's what I do in the clinic, so <laughs> this is real life. So aspirate, it's about, usually about 15, sometimes 20 milliliters. Um, when you um, put on a little swap like that, you see the, the, the fat, little fat bodies in there, and this is a range of motion immediately after aspiration. And for privacy reasons, so I had to cut off the face, but the face is totally different on the left than on the right. She's very happy. Surgery with associated lesions. This is why I, I test rotation. This was a patient on the, on the arthroscopic view, a patient with the block to rotation. And that's really simple to just take it out arthroscopically, whereas if you leave this, six months later, the damage is done. There's a lot of cartilage damage. Um, patients are stiff, and it becomes much more difficult to, to do something. When they're displaced, uh, like I said, two to five millimeters displacement, you can probably get away with uh, more than one third of the rail head. We get a CT scan to check the displacement and to check for associated lesion, and obviously, mostly to check for coronary fractures, which are uh, very often associated to rail head fractures. This is a uh, patient that's uh, uh, basically on the limit. Do we do surgery? Yes or no. But he's a professional cyclist and he needs to be back on the bike within, uh, you know, preferably tomorrow. And again, I feel more confident for him to be back on the bike if I put a, put a few screws in it and the rehab is much faster that way. So you can do this arthroscopically, of course. I don't, I don't really like that. I think reduction is difficult, whereas reduction with an open technique like this is much easier. I use a punch. Um, for, um, first of all, the reduction works very well with the punch. And secondly, when you punch it up, we all know that when you open a fracture and you're trying to piece it together, um, there's a gap. There's a gap and sometimes the screws don't hold. In this case, there's no gap because you're actually compressing the bone where the, where the screws more or less uh, are going to be. I don't drill um, bicortical, obviously, um, not even with, with my pin. So I drill unicortical. My screws are relatively short, and I put the pin back in at the end to make sure that I'm, I didn't violate the, the far cortex. So if you do this, then you don't need fluoroscopy to check if your screws are too long, because if the pin doesn't, go th doesn't fall through, you're sure you didn't violate the cortex with your screw. Whereas if, you, if the screw is too far, obviously the pin will go through, even if you didn't drill bicortical. So this is it. Luckily for him, he didn't have an LCL lesion. Uh, oh, the screws are always a little bit uh, oblique as well, they, so they, they become a little bit longer. And if they would be bicortical, uh, you probably didn't have a, you won't have a problem with it. I always make the same joke, this is actual speed. And you can do this through a two centimeter incision, as you can see. So type three fractures, there are three choices, osteosynthesis, resection, or prosthesis. And uh, that depends, obviously, on um, the fracture of the patient. Hi. 
I love skateboarders because they film themselves, so we have lots of nice videos. So this guy fell. Um, he, had a, he didn't only have a radial head fracture, he also had a very extensive soft tissue da damage. So we uh, resected his radial head, so we resect the fragments. Um, I wanted to fix it, but it was, that was impossible. After you've resected the fragments, then you check for stability, and the top one is the guy that fell in with the uh, with skateboard. Um, so obviously, completely valgus unstable. I, I put a real head prosthesis in. Although he was young, we still did it. And I left the MCL as it was, and it healed without uh, problems. The second one is another test that's described by, uh, by Adam Smith. Radius pull test. So you uh, put a clamp on the, on, the, on the stump, pull on it, use fluoroscopy for the, for the, uh, for the wrist, and this is obviously an Essex or Prestidies or longitudinal radial ulnar dissociation. Um, I see my preference is replacement because I don't like, I don't like uh, resection. So type three fractures, osteosynthesis, resection or prosthesis, rehab depends on the ligament, splint 24 hours, and then sometimes a brace. The majority will be conservative, mobilization, immediate mobilization, aspiration if possible, and surgery. For me, osteosynthesis is the first choice, even in so-called type three fractures, if we can fix it. We, pr we prefer to fix it, but replacement if needed. <laughs> Now, finally, I'm sorry, I'm running, I'm running late, but 10 minutes was, it was, that was impossible. Um, unfortunately, also personal, I've had a tennis elbow, and I just checked in the, uh, in the, in the panel, they all had tennis elbows. But it's, uh, it's actually very rare in professional players. It's the only professional player uh, that, uh, that I know had a tennis elbow, and I just found out this uh, pro had a tennis elbow as well at some point. So lateral elbow pain, and this is really what I tell my patients. So um, we, we won't go over clinical exam. That's uh, we all we all know uh, about this. X-ray, uh, ultrasound, MRI usually not needed. Um, the treatment is to teach the patients. So I tell them you have an overuse problem. Uh, because of the overuse, um, you get some inflammation. Because of the inflammation, you get an ingrowth of blood vessel into your tendon. If you look at a blood vessel, it's a hollow tube, nothing more, nothing less. <coughs> if you have many hollow tubes in your tendon, it might tear like, uh, like stamps used to tear. So you get a little tear. The tear heals, always, but it heals with a scar. And the difference between normal tendon, normal tendon is all the fibers are in the line of pull, and the scar tissue is chaotic. So I, I even do the hands, I tell them this, this is chaotic. So if you pull really hard on one of those fibers that may, may be in the wrong direction, you open it up, you tear it again, and that's how a tennis elbow becomes chronic. However, there's really good news. 90% will heal spontaneously. If you do nothing, just wait and see. 90% heals spontaneously, but unfortunately, that's the number after a year. So after a year, 90% will have healed. So the treatment is two groups. First is you try to speed up the healing process, and second is you try to decrease symptoms, and the fact that you're trying to gain time. There is some evidence that uh, physio and then stretching, with or without physio, stretching and eccentric exercise may, may speed up the process, but it doesn't change the percentage at the end of the year. Um, it, does, it does go well with my, uh, with my philosophy. You know, with the, you're trying to get the fibers of the, of, the, of the scar tissue to go in the line of pull, and the tendon will heal with scar tissue. The scar tissue will not disappear, but the, the scar tissue will take over the function of the tendon. How long do you need to gain time? I try to, uh, I, I don't do surgery if they haven't had problems for more than a year. So minimum a year, I tell them do what you can, not what you want. Time off work, no, that's a big thing in Belgium. We need to write uh, sick notes, so uh, don't do it. Because there is some, uh, again, I wasn't allowed to speak about evidence, but there is some evidence that time off work actually is uh, detrimental to the, um, to the healing. So you decrease symptoms, a brace helps to decrease symptoms. Uh, it has an immediate result. It doesn't matter what kind of brace you use, so we use the smallest one, not this one, it's just a picture I found on the internet. And I, and I tell them to wear it when you need it. My, my hair in the back of my neck comes up every time I see patients sitting in the waiting room with the brace on. That's not, that doesn't work. And I tell them you shouldn't do that because you need to use the tendon, because otherwise the tendon, the, the scar tissue won't heal. But if you do something where you think, okay, if I do this, I'm gonna tear it again, that's when you use the brace, maybe a couple of minutes. So analgesia, yes, we use uh, quite a lot of lidocaine patches, local anesthesia, uh, or uh, you can use local uh, non-steroidal uh, drugs. Cortisone, definitely no. Um, there's enough evidence to say that this is not good, so I try to um, steer them away from cortisone. PRP, maybe, blood, maybe, hyaluronic acid, homeopathy, Botox, why not? The reason why not cortisone is because it works very well at the begin at, uh, in early stage. It's the best one that we have. But after a year, only 70% heals, whereas without a cortisone shot, 90% uh, will heal. Surgery is the last option, and you can do it open or arthroscopic, and we do this 
um, first we do a um, percutaneous release, then I open it up after that. And the reason for the percutaneous release is because I, I need to be anterior to the LCL complex. And with the small incision that we use, if I palpate the LCL complex after the incision, I don't really feel it because I have the skin on both sides and the LCL, so that's why I do this that, that bit closed. Um, Debride the tendon, I put an anchor in. <coughs> we use an old suture anchor for this, but it's not, uh, I'm not sure if there's any evidence that's supporting this. But as you can see, this patient was a little bit unstable, and about 30%, uh, Christian Spros, who's in the, is in the room, was very interested when he visited us, and uh, um, looked this up, and about 30% have some type of instability. Post-op, again, this, uh, this brace, and um, Nick Edler, who might be in the room, is definitely in the, in the audience, showed that we had a 94% success rate with this approach. Thank you.